Lord, for the salvation you so freely give. And Lord, we thank you, Lord, that you turn away none who come to you, Lord. And Lord, thank you for using us to share the gospel message. Thank you, Lord, for loving us. Thank you for allowing us the privilege, Lord, to be a light, to be a testimony, to be a witness for you. I do pray, Lord, that you would bless us this evening, Lord. I pray that as we study your word, Lord, that you would uh, <clears throat> minister to our hearts, Lord, that you would speak to our hearts, and Lord, that the Holy Spirit would be our teacher and guide this evening. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen. All right, we're going to look in uh, Luke chapter 17. Luke 17, you should have a copy of the lesson. If you need a copy, you can slip your hand up there, and Ken will bring that by and give that to you. Uh, the lesson tonight is entitled Lessons uh, from Lot's Wife in uh, Luke chapter 17. And we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 22. It says, And he said unto his disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here. Or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. For as a lightning that lighteth out of the one part under, under heaven, shineth unto the other part under heaven, so also uh, the Son of Man be in his day. Uh, but first must he suffer many things, and be rejected of this generation. And as it was in the days of Noah, so shall it also be in the days of the Son of Man. Uh, they did eat, they drank, they married wives, they were given in marriage until the day that Noah entered into the ark and the flood came and destroyed them all. Likewise, also, as it was in the days of Lot, uh, they did eat, they drank, and they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. Uh, but the same day that Lot went out of Sodom, it rained fire and brimstone from heaven and destroyed them all. Even thus shall it be in the day when the Son of Man is revealed. In that day, he which shall be upon the housetop and his stuff in the house, let him not come down to take it away. And he that is in the field, let him likewise not return back. Remember Lot's wife. Whosoever shall seek to save his life shall lose it. And whosoever shall lose his life, he sh uh, shall preserve it. I tell you, in that uh, there might, uh, I'm sorry, there shall be two men in one bed, and one shall be taken, the other shall be left. Two women shall be grinding in the together, and the one shall be taken, and the other left. And two men shall be in the field, and one shall be taken, and the other left. And they answered and said unto him, Where, Lord? And he said unto them, Wheresoever the body is, thither will the eagles be gathered together. So verse 32 is our text. Remember Lot's wife. And uh, certainly we know the story of uh, Lot. We know how he and uh, his uncle Abraham traveled together. Their flocks became great. Uh, they would part their ways and... And the sad thing is, is Lot would gaze on the plains of uh, Sodom, and he would settle there. And the problem is that uh, Sodom was a wicked place to live, and he did not take that in consideration. And as a result of that, uh, he assimilated, really, his family into the whole culture that was in Sodom. And so when God would come and he would warn that it's time to uh, get out of Sodom uh, because judgment was going to come. Uh, he really seemed to be as a hypocrite uh, to his family because he lived there. He was associated with it. And, uh, and Jesus, in this passage where he's talking about his return and the coming of the Lord, the great day of the Lord, uh, he mentions here that we need to remember Lot's wife. So there's some things we can learn from her in reference to being with her husband uh, in uh, Sodom. Uh, we're living in days of where Bible prophecy is being examined more and more. And uh, certainly I was listening to the radio the other day on, my, on the way over here to church and and just interesting, over the last several weeks, that it seems like wherever channel I'm turning on, somebody's preaching on Bible prophecy. 
Uh, many are trying to speculate when Jesus Christ will return. Uh, some uh, uh, light is shed on this subject in the passage that we just read. And there's several things here that Jesus highlights for us in reference to his return uh, that we need to be uh, concerned about. First of all, uh, there's this uh, situation where we need to watch out for those who want to make predictions. Notice in verse 22, he says, And he said unto his disciples, The days will come when ye shall desire to see one of the days of the Son of Man, and ye shall not see it. And they shall say to you, See here or see there, go not after them, nor follow them. And so uh, people like to try to make predictions or point people towards a false Christ. Uh, because they're trying to identify the situations in the world in which we're living and they bring in their own thoughts and processes of uh, educating themselves in and to the point of contradicting scripture of thinking when they can predict when Jesus Christ is coming again. The real reality is no man knows the day or the hour Amen. when Jesus Christ will come and so someone wants to start putting time frames or predictions on the return of Christ, you need to run and get away from them. Amen. You need to throw their materials in the trash and not uh, worry about what they have to say. But also, not only uh, we need to watch out for those that make predictions, but in the passage here in verse 24, Jesus reveals that he will come quickly or suddenly. Notice in verse 24, For as a lightning that lighteth out of one part under, under heaven, shineth unto another part under heaven, so also, I'm sorry, so shall also the Son of Man be in his day. And so there'll be a quick uh, return of Christ. The Apostle Paul would write in his epistles and speak of Christ coming as a thief in the night. Uh, we don't know when it's going to happen. He would talk about in the twinkling of an eye, the rapture is going to take place, the resurrection will take place, our bodies will be changed. And, and so the sudden appearing of Christ. And uh, you think of all that in the Old Testament was revealed, all the scriptures concerning the, the uh, coming of the Messiah. Uh, and literally, if you figure all the numbers out, I mean, it is to the day when Jesus presented himself as the king of Israel on that uh, day, what we celebrate as Palm Sunday, uh, it, it's all predicted and foretold in the Old Testament. Amen. And uh, and suddenly there he was, the Messiah. And they certainly knew the scriptures and the prophecies, but they rejected him. He came to his own, but his own received him not. And so you, 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 it's an amazing thought that the immediate return of Christ is the immediate withdrawal of the, the church out of the uh, world, and uh, the world's going to be confused to try to figure out what is going on. His, his coming is going to be sudden. And then uh, his, in verse 25, his coming will be unexpected. It says, first must he suffer many things and be rejected of this generation. And so it'll be unexpected. Why? Because in verse 26, he goes on and says, as it was in the days of Noah, so uh, uh, shall it be also in the days of the Son of Man. They did eat, they drank, they married wives, uh, they were given in marriage. And then in verse 28, he says, it also, likewise also, as it was in the days of Lot, they did eat, and they drank, they bought, they sold, they planted, they built it. So in the days of Noah, it is paralleled or copied even in the days of Lot. And we see that characteristics or that statement of uh, uh, the, the society in which we live, that there's a total distraction. There is a complete unexpectancy on the heart of people because they're so consumed with everything that the world is offering and everything they're involved in in their world that when Jesus does come, it's going to be unexpected. And uh, we, we're not, many people are not expecting Jesus to come in their lifetime. I am. Amen. I really do. I, I read the scriptures years ago when I first got saved and I couldn't understand why the apostles felt as though 
the Lord was going to come in their lifetime. I do now. And, uh, but to the world, his return is unexpected. And then he tells us in verse 34 through 36 that uh, some will be taken and some will be left behind. And when he comes, uh, uh, there'll be those, I, I thought when I was reading the scriptures, I, I had to keep going because I think of things and my mind is a little weird, I guess. But I thought it was interesting that he says there were two men in the bed, but yet there was two women that were grinding. <laughs> Amen. Men are sleeping and the women are working. There you go. And uh, now somebody's going to say something about that on the internet. Anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> when Jesus returns, there'll be one who'll be taken and one who'll be left behind. Uh, why? Because those that are Christians, those who have believed on Christ, you've been born again. When Jesus comes, the church will be raptured. You'll be caught up in the heavens. But those who rejected Christ will left, be left behind. And so in all of this passage here, he's talking about his return and his coming for his uh, children and what it's going to be like when he comes. And he makes this statement right in the middle of all of it. Remember Lot's wife. And so, you know, in light of the fact that he is challenging us to acknowledge what took place in Lot's wife, there ought to be something that we can learn from her. He says, remember. I, I put down here, memory is a precious thing. Uh, the ability to recall information and material. Uh, there are those who cannot remember uh, for many reasons. Uh, there are those that lose memory because of traumatic experience. There's many who choose to block things out of their memory because of tragedies went through. There are st those that can't remember because of the fact of medical condition and problems. And uh, here is the Lord reminding us as a society and as a people, we need to remember what happened to Lot's wife. Why? Because he is coming again. And he's coming for his people. We need to be a people that is ready to meet the Lord. And so the lessons we can learn from Lot's wife. In Luke chapter 21, in verse 34 uh, through 36, he goes on to say in Luke chapter 21 and uh, verse 34, says, And take heed to yourselves, lest at any time your hearts be overcharged with superfieting and drunkenness and cares of this life, and so that the day come upon you unawares, for as a snare shall it come on all them that dwell on the face of the whole earth. <coughs> Watch ye therefore and pray always that ye may be accounted worthy to escape all these things that shall come to pass and to stand before the Son of Man. And so this, this things with the lessons that we need to learn in reference to the coming of Christ. And uh, certainly the judgment of God was going to come on Sodom and on Gomorrah. And it is clear that Lot's wife had not learned anything about being ready to have to meet God in reference to judgment. 2 Peter 3.10 says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens shall pass away with a great noise, and the elements shall melt with fervent heat, and the earth also, and the works that are therein shall be burned up. And so in light of Christ's focus on this matter of his return and what the character of society would be when he returns, uh, and he tells us we need to remember Lot's wife, then we need to go back to Genesis. Amen. Back to Genesis chapter 19 and verse 15 to pick up the narrative of Lot being warned to come out of uh, Sodom and that he is to bring his family to, to deliver them into a place of safety and uh, learn what we can from uh, Lot's wife's response. So first of all, we see this in Genesis chapter 19 and verse 15. It says, And when the morning arose, then the angels hastened Lot, saying, 
Arise, take thy wife and thy two daughters, which are here, lest thou be consumed in the iniquity of the city. And uh, certainly one thing we need to be aware of is the iniquity abounds in the world that we live in. So I, we must come out from among them and be separate. And uh, Lot had not led his family in that direction to be separated from the society that surrounded him and where he had settled. And as a result of it, because they were in Sodom, Sodom got into them. And so this passage shows us this, that God desired to redeem her. And God desired to deliver her. And because he Lot uh, is spoken to by the angels, and he's hurried along to make sure that he takes his wife and his two daughters. And so that shows me that there is this matter of, of, of being concerned for family to be delivered. God desires to redeem uh, Lot's wife. He desires to redeem those that are lost. So I see, first of all, that there is equality of God's redemption plan. The equality of God's redemption plan. Uh, because God is, is wanting to deliver Lot out of the city the same as he wants to deliver his wife and his two daughters. And so, you know, you know it's interesting today, everybody's all about equality. Everything, everybody's got to be equal, equality. Well, there's equality in God's redemption plan. In other words, uh, number one in your notes would just be this. There is no self-salvation. In other words, you can't save yourself, and you can't make yourself right with God. Uh, how we need the grace and the mercy of God to bring conviction on us so that we can be responsive to the prodding of the Holy Spirit that we can be saved. It is not by our labors ourselves. And Cain and Abel in the days of Cain, Cain tried to worship God and be right with God with the labor of his own hands. And so the lesson that we need to learn from Lot's wife is that there is equality in redemption. In other words, if God's not willing that any should perish, he does not place on one group of people a heavy burden in matters of salvation and, does not, and then not do it to someone else. God is no respecter of persons, and if he is no respecter of persons, then that means we must uh, treat every person equal in communicating the redemption of God. In Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, There is not a just man upon earth that doeth good and sinneth not. And so there's equality in the redemption plan of God because not one person is good enough to be able to work out his own salvation. Not one person can develop a, a, a deliverance plan in their own life. And so uh, Lot's wife, his daughters, and Lot himself would all be delivered the same way. They all had to leave uh, the city of Sodom and Gomorrah. So it shows me here equality that there's no self-salvation. Number two in your notes there is it's demonstrated. In other words, God does not show favoritism when it comes to salvation, and God has demonstrated it for us, uh, first of all, through prophecy. All the way back in Genesis chapter 3, in uh, verse 15, God said, I will put enmity between thee and the woman, and between thy seed and her seed, and it shall bruise thy head, and thou shalt bruise his heel. And so prophetically speaking, God said and stated uh, that he would send the Messiah, he would send the Son of God into this world, that he would defeat the work of the devil, and that man could be saved and delivered through that one that would come as the Savior of the world. And all the way through the Old Testament, from Genesis chapter 3 in verse 15, and on, prophecy is laid out in reference to uh, who Christ is and what Christ would do when he had come. And so God demonstrated this equality of redemption as Jesus Christ uh, came into this world. He came to his own, but his own received him not. 
And here's the equality. In verse 12 it says, But as many as received him, to them gave you the power to become the sons of God, even to them that believe on his name. And so it's, it's, it doesn't matter whether it's Jew or Gentile, prophetically God had so stated that he would provide a way of redemption for all of mankind. And so if God desires for her to be delivered, then it certainly ought to be our desire to see other people delivered and developing a faith in Christ. So I see it's demonstrated by prophecy. I see that it's demonstrated by typology. In uh, chapter 22 of Genesis and uh, verse 13, we know that Abraham is taking his son, his only son Isaac, uh, whom he loved. Uh, Isaac was the promised seed that God had uh, foretold Abraham, he would bless him with a son, and he did that when he was 100 years old. But then God commands him to take him up on the Mount Moriah and offer him there as a sacrifice. And Abraham's response in verse 8 of chapter 22, uh, Abraham said, My son, God will provide himself a lamb for the burnt offering. And then down in verse 13, Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, behind him a ram caught in the thicket of, of by his thorns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a burnt offering instead of his son. Uh, why is that? Because the typology that is there, Abraham's son was his only son, the son that he loved, and uh, that was the only son by promise. You say, well, he had a son, Ishmael. Uh, that's true with Hagar, but his son that he had by promise was Isaac. And his son that was going to be offered was Isaac. And the uh, offering of Isaac was halted because God provided a lamb to be slain to shed the blood and be the sacrifice that God would accept to provide redemption and deliverance is all a type of what Jesus Christ would be and what he would do. John would see Jesus coming. He would say, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. And uh, you get over into Revelation, you find that Jesus is the Lamb slain before the foundation of the world. And so this matter of God's desire to redeem or deliver Lot's wife is one is revealed through prophecy and through typology. And then it's also revealed uh, personally, personal, uh, personal personality. Amen. I'll get it out. In uh, 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 chapter 19, in uh, verse 15, uh, he would speak in reference to the fact that uh, uh, Jesus Christ, uh, uh, the offering or the sacrifice would be. Uh, uh, Jesus himself in John 1 29 I got ahead of myself but that's all right uh, he was the lamb of God slain before the foundation of the world he was a lamb that would uh, take away the sins of man uh, also in chapter 22 and verse 13 I believe it is is where uh, uh, yes instead of his son uh, Jesus Christ was offered up uh, for us to be able to be delivered so this whole concept that God's desire for Lot's wife was that she might be redeemed. And he demonstrated that uh, through the equality of redemption uh, through uh, out the scriptures. And then I not only see the equality of God's redemption, but I see the longevity of God's redemption plan. And I, I'm thankful that if God is not willing that any should perish, and that means his redemption is going to have to go from generation to generation to generation. Uh, now, we know this, that in the Old Testament, when it deals with the redemption of God, the Old Testament was looking forward to what God was going to do in providing salvation. Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 11 says, And every priest standeth daily ministering and offering all times the same sacrifices, which can never take away sins. See, oftentimes we will say, well, people were saved in the Old Testament because of the sacrifices that were offered. No, they weren't. 
The sacrifice could not wash away their sins. But in verse 12, it tells us, But this man, that's Jesus, after he had offered one sacrifice for sins forever, sat down on the right hand of God. And so the longevity of the sacrifice of Jesus Christ is the fact that uh, the Old Testament saints were saved because they were looking forward to what Jesus Christ was going to do when he died on Calvary. Now the New Testament saints were looking back. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, we often read this every Sunday when we have communion, but in verse 25, it says, This cup is the New Testament in my blood. This do you as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. And so uh, the Old Testament saints were looking forward to what Christ was going to do. The New Testament saints are looking back at what Christ has already done when he died on Calvary for you and for me. And so he's, uh, well, the Old Testament, New Testament, I'm sorry, is looking back. That's your next point there, Jack. And so uh, we are both, Old Testament and New Testament, we are both saved by the same God in the same way. He desires all of us to be delivered, and we are saved the same way, longevity in reference to from year to year to generation to generation. Uh, it is the same way. It is simply your perspective of what you see or how you view it. Old Testament is looking forward. New Testament is looking backwards. But both are looking towards the cross. And both have to realize this, that it's God's desire to redeem us. And he warns us. He invites us. Uh, and he'll save us if we'll turn to the cross of Jesus Christ. Amen. The redemption that God provided. But then in the millennium, it's the same way. The Old Testament, they're looking forward. The Old New Testament, we're looking backwards. In the millennium, they're looking within. Notice in Revelation chapter 12, in verse 10, it says, And I heard a loud voice saying, In heaven now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of God and the power of his Christ. For the accuser of the brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night, and they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, and they loved not their lives unto death. Therefore rejoice, ye heavens, and ye that dwell in them. Woe to the inhabitants of the earth and of the sea, for the devil is come down unto you, having great wrath, because he knoweth that he has but a short time. And so the tribulation saints are going to be saved the same way through the blood of Christ, but they're going to have to make some decisions based on the fact of whether they're going to have faith to trust the sacrifice of Christ as the devil wages wrath on the world because he knows his time is limited, but God is still not willing that any should perish. And so they have to look within and examine their own heart whether they be in the faith or not. And so God's, we can learn from Lot's wife that God desired to redeem her. Uh, God, it wasn't, you know, people say, well, God is so wicked, God's so mean, God is so cruel, he just sends people to hell. No, no, he does everything that is possible to get us to respond to the redemption that he has to offer. And because he is a just God, he cannot treat one person differently from someone else. And so there's the equality and the longevity of the redemption plan of God. He longed to be able to deliver her, desired to redeem her. Then Roman numeral 2, and back in Genesis chapter 19, in verse 16, it says, And while he lingered, the men laid hold of upon his hand and upon the hand of his wife and upon the hand of his two daughters and the Lord being merciful unto them and they brought him forth and set him without the city. Now, God protected them uh, in their lingering. 
Uh, and they were supposed to get out of the city. They didn't get out of the city. His wife is dragging her feet in the commitment of getting out of the city. And literally, the angels grab them by the hands and take them out of the city. Don't tell me God is cruel. Don't tell me God is mean. Amen. Because God has done everything, even in their lingering right. and their dragging of their feet. A God has put them in a position where they're removed from the wickedness of that city. And so God protected her, her lingering. Uh, here's some thoughts about that. Letter A. Man's procrastination is dangerous. I've had people over the years tell me, well, you know, I know all about the tribulation. I want to, yeah, if I get into the tribulation, I miss the rapture. I, I, I'll, I'll trust the Lord then. No, you won't. No, no. no you won't. Procrastination is dangerous. Well, I'll get saved next week. Uh, no, you won't. No, you won't. No, no. My spirit shall not always strive with man. That's what Genesis chapter 6 tells us. And you, may, you don't know. You don't get sa saved on your timetable. You get saved on God's timetable. And uh, so the pro procrastination is dangerous because the longer you put off getting saved, the harder your heart becomes towards God. I've seen people, I've tried to lead to the Lord, and I've seen them sit there, and I mean, there are tears in their eyes and weeping, and, there, and something will happen, the phone will ring, or somebody will come by the door, or whatever. Something will distract them, and, and, and they just, all of a sudden, they, you can see just their countenance changes. Uh, you say, okay, well, I'll stop back and see you next week. You stop back and see them the next week, and oh, they're polite, but they won't give you the time to let you come in and talk to them again. Then you go back again another week or so later, and they're hard as nails. I mean, they don't want to even talk to you. They're, they're arrogant against you. They don't want you to come in their house and tell you, stay away from me. Don't come over here. Uh, the procrastination of man is dangerous because it hardens your heart against God. And it hardens your uh, sensitivity to what God is wanting to do in your life. And you think you are okay without God. And, but yet here in the midst of it, God is still protecting. And God is still moving in her life. So man's procrastination is dangerous. Let her be as this. God's protection is gracious. And um, uh, you look at the world, you want to see the grace of God. Look at the world, how corrupt it is. The only reason why this world is still in existence is because of the graciousness of God. That's it. And, uh, and God is extending his grace towards us. And what, how do we know that? Number one there is just this. He keeps you alive. Uh, he keeps you alive. Right. Psalm 23, 6 says, Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. And so the graciousness of God, the protection of God, keeps us alive. And all the, I was thinking the other day, some of the things, how God has kept me alive. I remember driving a bus and, and in, in the snow, and there's accidents going on, cars spinning out everywhere, and I went right through the middle of them. And, uh, and didn't touch a one of them, kept on going. I said, thank you, Lord. Uh, I remember driving tractor and trailer. I would be so tired. And uh, I would drive on for days on end without getting sleeping. And I remember being so tired. I was a buddy of mine was driving truck. I was driving truck. We were following each other. And uh, uh, coming into hometown, Salem, to pick up glass at Anchor Hocking Glass. And when we came into the city, you're supposed to go left. I went right. He was following behind me in his truck. He said, Mike, where are you going? I said, I'm going over here to Thatcher Glass. He said, what do you mean, Thatcher Glass? We're supposed to be going into Anchor Hockey. We're in Salem. <laughs> I didn't know where I was at. Um, I, I, how in the world I ever got there? I was taking a load out to Washington, uh, uh, Pennsylvania, and uh, I was going out there. I had to get off, go to Washington. Washington's about 15, 20 miles from Wheeling, West Virginia. And I'm riding. I'm on my way there. And I remember seeing the sign, Washington, two miles. 
the exit is two miles. The next thing I remember was welcome to Wheeling, West Virginia. <laughs> I don't know how I got there, but I knew that I had to turn around and go back. I'm thankful right. that God keeps us alive. Amen. Uh, this, this man should have been dead a long time ago. But God in his grace, he keeps us alive. I know God's protection is gracious. Oh, yeah. I've watched him. Not only that, but he keeps you from his wrath. And uh, the wonderful thing is about the church, a lot of people think that uh, the church is going to go through the tribulation period. And uh, that's okay. If you want to go through, we'll meet you on the other side. Uh, but I'll tell you, I'm going out on the first loop. <laughs> I'll wait until later. And uh, well, the rapture camp can go uh, get here soon enough, I'm telling you that. In 1 Thessalonians chapter 1 and verse 10, it says, And to wait for the Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. Uh, the tribulation period is God's wrath being poured out on this world. And if God has delivered me from his wrath, I'm not waiting for it. Amen. I'm getting out of here. And so God's protection is gracious. God's wrath was going to fall on Sodom and Gomorrah, but the angels had grabbed the hands of Lot, his daughters, and his wife, and took them out of there. You talk about a great illustration of uh, the ability of God to take us out of this world before the wrath of God comes. A great illustration that we can learn from uh, Lot's wife. So he keeps us alive. He keeps you from his wrath. And he keeps uh, this world in existence. Now, in other words, this world would fall apart if it wasn't for the Lord uh, keeping it going. You always get tickled. Everything nowadays is global warming. You got up this morning, you overslept. That's because of global warming. <laughs> Your kids are getting uh, uh, lazy and overweight. It's because of global warming. That's what they're saying right now. Yeah, yeah, man. I, I tell you, it's all global warming. Everything's global warming. The world's going to die. The world's going to fall apart. It ain't falling apart until the Lord allows it to fall apart. In Hebrews chapter 1 and verse 3, who being in the brightness, being the brightness of his glory and the express image of his person and upholding all things by the word of his power, when he had by himself purged our sins, sat down on the right hand of the majesty on high. I am not afraid of global warming because of the fact is God keeps it going. The world is in the hands of God and God can do what he wants. If he wants to destroy the world, it's okay. He created it. Amen. He owns it. It's his. He can do what he wants with it. Amen. And so... Here is a Lot's wife dragging her feet, lingering, coming out of the Sodom and Gomorrah. The angels take them out. Why? Because God's protection is always gracious towards us. And then I see this. There is this matter of the evidence exposition. Now, you know, the evidence of God working in their life was exposed, in other words. Psalm 119.94 says, I am thine, save me. For I have sought thy precepts. I'm telling you, the evidences of God's grace and God's mercy and God's protection when we're dragging our feet where God wants us to be and what he wants us to do is evidence constantly uh, as we live for him and obey his uh, precepts. So God protected our lingering. Number three there, God provided an opportunity to demonstrate faith. In Genesis chapter 19, verse 17, it came to pass when they had brought them forth abroad that he said, Escape for thy life, look not behind thee, neither stay thou in all the plain, escape to the mountain, lest thou be consumed. So God is providing them an opportunity to demonstrate faith. The amazing thing is this. God, all God requires of us is to have faith, but he always gives us opportunity to demonstrate our faith. And so letter A is just simply this, belief, belief. 
And what do we have to believe in? That Jesus is the light. John 1, 7, John testifies to the fact that he came to bear witness of the light. And the light that we have is Jesus Christ. And so we need to demonstrate that faith that we have as we trust him and believe him. And then in John chapter 2 and verse 22, it's in reference to the scriptures. What has been so stated in the word of God? Can you believe what he said? Can you trust what he said? And then number three is Jesus himself. In John chapter 22 and 22, also Acts 16, 31, uh, you know, the Philippian jailer asked Paul and Silas what they asked to do to be saved. He said, believe on the name of, of the Lord Jesus Christ, and thou shalt be saved in thyself. And so this matter of what do you believe in, Lot's wife needed to demonstrate her faith in her God, in faith in Christ. Why? Because the angels brought her out. I mean, I don't know how much easier it had to be. The angels led them out of the city. Now all they got to do is flee to the mountain like the angels warned them. Demonstrate your faith. Uh, Dr. Moore always said, God will never do for you what you can do for yourself. We have the faith to believe that God is able, but I want to guarantee you this. There are always opportunities for us to be able to demonstrate our faith. Why? Because letter B is this. It, there's belief and then there's action. James, you can look at these verses later. James tells us not just to be hearers of the word, but doers of the word. Lot's wife heard the warning. She heard the word. She witnessed God's leading in bringing her out of Sodom. But when it came time for her to take action to demonstrate her faith, uh, she turned around, she looked on the city of Sodom, she was turned to a pillar of salt. And so God gives us opportunities to demonstrate our faith. And so then the last thing is this. Is God rain judgment on her divided heart? In Genesis chapter 19 and verse 26 says, But his wife looked back from behind him, and she became a pillar of salt. Uh, first of all, just realize this. She was unstable. She was unstable. James 1 8 says a double minded man is unstable in all of his ways. Uh, you can't have it both ways. You can't be gazing on the world and desiring for the world and desire God at the same time. Amen. Jesus said, No man can serve two masters. You can't have it both ways. Amen. And so she was unstable because the unsaved are undecided. Oh, they might talk about God, and they might say they want to know who God is, and they might desire to have the blessings of God, but they're undecided. And uh, I've always trusted my church, or I've always tried to do good, or I'm, I'm always thinking about God, or I always pray, but when you confront them about trusting the Lord, it's one day they think they want to trust Christ, and another day they don't want to trust Christ. They're unstable. A double-minded man is always unstable in all of his ways. He's unstable, but the unsaved, but then we've got to think of the saved. The saved are uncommitted. Now, Lot's wife, it's debatable whether she was a believer or not. Uh, you know, it's, it's amazing that she was forcibly taken out of the city. But I think of all the influence before they got to Sodom, as far as Lot being the nephew of Abraham and, and all that God had revealed and done in the life of Abraham as they were traveling together, uh, you know, th and there's a possibility that she could have been saved. I don't know. The Bible isn't clear about that. But it is for sure that if she was saved, at the very least, or I should say the very best, uh, she was uncommitted. And, uh, and people are uh, saved and might be going to heaven, but they're not committed. Why? Because they want to, they wonder about their friends. Or what about my home? Or what about my job? Or what about all the things and places I enjoy? And, 
And we, we have a tendency to constantly put things that are in the world in front of God. Why is that? Because our heart's divided. Because when it comes down to it, you, you can't make up your mind. Are you going to be committed completely, surrendered to the Lord and live the Christian life? Or are you going to be connected with and consumed with the things that are in the world? The two are not compatible with each other. And so she was unstable. She needed to be single-minded. And that's what Paul says in Philippians 3, 13 and 14. Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do. It would be wonderful if we as believers could get that settled in our hearts. This one thing that we need to do. This one thing I do. Forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press towards the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. That's, that, that's, that's the only thing we need. That's it. Because that will always keep us going in the right direction with the right focus and the right understanding because it will be always pursuing God. So here's some closing thoughts here. I wrote them down in your notes. God is not willing that anyone should perish. You need to remember that. And you need to share that with people because God wants them saved. I don't care if they're religious. I don't care what their nationality is. I don't care what their financial standing is. I don't care what their political position is. God wants them saved. Number two, God's watch care protects us. You need to stop worrying about what's going on in the world, whether we're going to be safe or not, or going to be provided for or not. And just remind yourself that it is God's watch care that protects us. Amen. And then, number three, you need to realize God opens opportunities for us to know him personally. And, and certainly, Lot's wife could have had a personal walk with God. All she had to do was step out by faith. God did everything to give her the opportunity to do so. And then the last thought is this. God remains the almighty judge of all. Because in the end, he pours out his wrath on Sodom and Gomorrah. But Lot's wife being lost and being turned to a pillar of salt was her own decision. Because God's wrath is going to come. Man's not going to stop God's wrath. And so we need to make a decision for the Lord. And so we can learn some lessons from Lot's wife and good lessons that will help us in our resolve to walk with God in this untoward world that we live in. Amen. I hope that's a blessing to you. There's some verses that we didn't read. You look up and you can look them up in, uh, uh, in your own personal study. We need to pray together. Uh, we need to add uh, Linda Wood. That's Kenny Wood's sister. Uh, her cancer is progressing uh, again. So if you can pray for her, uh, they would appreciate that. And is there anything else we need to add? Oh, Armin. I see Armin on here. He's got uh, pneumonia. And so be praying for her. Armin. Uh, anything else? Yes, Tony. Uh, good friend of mine's 15-year-old nephew. He's been under pressure a couple of times. Uh, he's battling with lymphoma. And he's having a real hard time with the medicines right now. He's back in the hospital. And uh, he's, they actually have make a wish involved with this, this young kid's, you know, uh, yeah. situation right now. Yeah, and, man. you know, you got to pray for salvation for the family. Yeah. you got to pray for wisdom with the doctors dealing with this illness. And you got to pray for strength for falling and for... Uh, family get through this yeah amen so pray for uh, tony's friends uh, son who's 15 years old still struggling uh problems with the medication they need to be saved let's pray that someone will be able to talk to them and lead them to the lord pray for wisdom on the part of the doctors to know how to treat this young boy and let's pray that god will heal him and raise him up yes barbara um unspoken <laughs> all right Let's pray for Barbara, unspoken. Okay, anything else? Yes, Tom. Well, uh, praise for this gentleman I met uh, 
I don't know, uh, tracking. Yeah. And uh, his name is Mike McClellan. He is, he's right here. Yeah. He's right here. He said, you know, I, I can do this. I can do this. I said, no, you can't. Christ does it for you. Yeah. Okay? And, you know, I met him three times. Yeah. The last time I was out there, I had a Jehovah Witness on me. And it, it's, I, I lost four people, yeah, you know, sure. going past. So he came up later on and he said, I was telling him about it. He says, that Jehovah Witnesses, what was, what was bothering you? Oh, mm. <laughs> too bad I wasn't here. Yeah. This guy's a huge, huge guy. Yeah, right. And, but I said, that's not the, not the, not the deal, yeah. right? Yeah. You just go on and then he says, I know, I know. I get, I get excited. Sure. So, Mike McClellan. Mike. It, Mike. Mike McMahon. M. Lord knows. All right, so pray for Mike McMillan that uh, Tom's been witnessing to him. Let's pray that he'll come to faith in Christ. Amen. Jack. I'm looking for more so God's blessing on everyone. Amen. All right, Jack's moving tomorrow. He's in the house. He's in the house. And, uh, praise God, he's moving, but not out of the area. Amen. Amen. <laughs> Let's pray for an easy move tomorrow. Yes, Dana. And uh, just praise my dad. Um, he's been on the prayer list on and off for the last two years with his stage four cancer. He just got his test results back. He's in remission. There's no cancer at all. Hey, Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Amen. Glory. Praise God. Well, thank the Lord for that. Praise God in prayer tonight. <laughs> Amen. Amen. Just focus for my brother, Chuck. Joanne's brother, Chuck. Okay, anything else? Yes. Um, my niece, Layla, she's 14. She's been having um, like a myriad of weird health problems, but the most concerning is that her heart rate has been, like her pulse mm. has been yeah. wildly fluctuating. She'll lay down and stand up and it will go from like 50 to 90. Yeah. Um, she keeps getting dizzy and nauseous. Uh -huh. Be sure to be praying. We need some Sunday school teachers, junior church workers, so you'd be praying about that and uh, see if who the Lord would lay on your heart to uh, ask them to do that, and you never know. It may be you. Amen. Jeremiah, Lord, send me. And so we need some Sunday school teachers. All right. Uh, let's pray for a great service this Sunday. God has been good to us, so let's thank him and let's rejoice in the goodness of our God. God bless you. Amen.